Hello, everyone. My name is Warren Black. I'm the morning host at All Classical Portland, the local classical show. Oh, oh, okay. You've heard of it. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I'm delighted to be having a conversation tonight with a great musician and a great represent a rep representative of the symphony, but also a good friend of mine. Nancy Ives is the principal cellist with the Oregon Symphony. So, yes. Good evening. And, uh, and lots of good stuff on the uh, bill of fare tonight, you might say. I think it's a yummy meal. We yeah. like to use food. <laughs> food yeah, generally when we talk, the <laughs> food comes up a lot. So. And we agreed that the first piece, the Jennifer Higdon Blue Cathedral, is not really an appetizer. That would be this. This is the appetizer. Yeah. That's a little more substantial than your usual appetizer. So. Yeah. We're the small plates tonight. So. <laughs> yes. But yeah, the Jennifer Higdon, um, the first time being performed by the Oregon Symphony, but and it's just. my first time personally as well, which kind of amazes me because it's, um, it's pretty much an instant classic from when it was written in 2000. I found out that many of my colleagues, much younger ones than I, um, given that it was written in 2000, have extremely fond memories of playing this piece in youth symphony or all state orchestra. So it's, and it's not that it's an easy piece, but it's, um, I guess it just, they figured out it was really good for the ambitious young groups to be exposed to something really contemporary. Uh, and I can see how thrilling it would be to have done it. Yeah, and written for, well, written for the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, so I don't know, maybe that's oh. why a lot of students do it, I don't know. But that makes sense. Yeah, but it's, uh, I only came across it a couple of years ago and was just kind of wild by the recording that we have at, uh, at All Classical, but yeah, it's, um, well, you were describing it as quintessentially American. What yes. do you think? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> well, what, I know, because you know, I can't seem to come up with <laughs> the, the words. I have a doctorate. I think I should be able to speak about this sort of thing, and I just can't. I don't understand <laughs> why precisely, but I, when I hear this piece, I, I instantly go, oh yeah, American. Yeah, well, and it's Jennifer Higdon. It's very, there's, there's a kind of intensity to a lot of what she does. Um, but yeah, Blue Cathedral is the name of the piece. And blue works on a lot of levels. Um, we were talking about synesthesia um, at one of the earlier chats. And to me, I, I'm not a synesthete, but I can kind of feel you know, a large, big blue um, cathedral. Well, and she talks, oh, there we go. And <laughs> she talks about, um, in her, her notes about the piece, which I find extremely moving, she talks about the color of the sky because the piece is very much uh, her, the inspiration for the piece. It's her brother who passed away young from cancer and his middle name was Blue. So that's where the, the color comes from. And I have to admit, I, before I knew that, I just thought she likes to use color as a source of inspiration because I've also played a two movement piano trio. She wrote um, one movement is fiery red and the other is pale yellow. Um, beautiful, wonderful pieces, really satisfying to play. Um, but apparently it, it's also about, it's a very direct homage to her brother. And the, the brother and, and she, the brother and sister, she and her brother are represented by the flute and the clarinet and she's as specific as to have the flute start first because she's the oldest sibling. And she was the flutist and he was the clarinetist. Yeah, and then she dropped, the flute drops out, and the, the clarinet moves on. I guess the thing I was thinking about, so I, I was here for, this, for the show yesterday afternoon, and uh, what I thought was there's this continual, well, we've talked about the fact that there's not really a, you know, not a melody you'll go home humming from that piece, but there is this sense of, of lift of throughout the piece of just rising and rising. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really yeah. spectacular, actually, yeah. how she achieves that over the course of, of 13 minutes, you know, and yet it's still, there, there's no, it's not like, th it, it's not as simple as just, let's get higher and higher pitched. It's not at all that, and yet yeah. she does achieve that. And although, as we're saying, there's no, um, there's not a lot of melody that you will go away humming or that is um, 
easy to tell is the, the sort of uh, theme. There are beautiful long lines that are being sung by the flute, by the clarinet. Uh, so we get Martha and James, two uh, gorgeous yeah. players. And then Sarah plays a gorgeous solo on the violin. Um, there is a more stormy metal section with a lot of energetic brass work. And some of that, oh, our maestro, who we, we haven't started to talk about yet, but I have some <laughs> fun things. I took notes all week because in rehearsal because he was saying so many things. I thought, oh, I've got to be sure and share that with people at the pre-concert talk. Um, and one thing he said was that some of these brass parts are the relic of a broken symphony. So when you, when you get to see, hear some of the brass where there's just sort of pieces of, there, it's not, it's not just a straightforward, oh, it's a brass chorale. It's, 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 um, it's more evocative than yeah, just that. Yeah. I'm thinking in terms of, if you think of bolero as just going like that, this is more like a da 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 da. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yeah. And it's, well, it is really lovely. Right. So you mentioned the, new, the conductor who's a guest conductor tonight and his first time conducting the Oregon Symphony, mm -hmm. uh, Mario Venzago, who is Swiss. Yes. And, yes. and delight. He's just a delight. You're going to have so much fun tonight. You're going to fall in love with him. We did in rehearsal. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, he really so charming so, and, and so erudite. But also every, every moment of music making is completely from the heart. In fact, you may occasionally see him like this while he is going to us, putting his hand over his heart to acknowledge us. So it, it, he's just very lovely and had a lot of really um, great ideas that we had no trouble latching onto right away. Sometimes when you have someone new, it takes some time to figure out what they're going for. Um, but in this case, it's just so, uh, such a complete picture that even when things were extremely different than we normally do them, and I, we will get to that, <laughs> we were still able to enthusiastically sign on and go for it. Um, he has actually done Blue Cathedral with the composer in attendance. So that was another, you know, like, okay, he, he, he knows it straight from the horse's mouth, so that was good. Yeah. Oh, and uh, and also uh, a last well, yeah, last minute ish soloist change. You actually see on your tickets it's Lars Folk, but it's in fact uh, Inan Barnaton, who I, I was really delighted to think like, oh wow, I, I would have loved to see either of those pianists, but he yeah. Inan Barnaton is fantastic. Yeah, I was thrilled to see. It's like, oh, that's our replacement. I mean, he's he's great, um, and I, in fact, I don't. There were all these little, um, the last time, little, little, little threads of connection here. The last time he performed with us was 2018 when he did the Copeland Piano Concerto, and it really wowed us, the orchestra, it really did. Um, there was a Haydn Symphony on that concert, but there was also a piece by a female composer, Catherine Balch. Uh, it was conducted by June Merkel, our principal uh -huh. guest conductor now, and it was Brahms' fourth symphony. Yeah. So. That's, I mean, I know that's not that identical, but you, you know, it still felt like, oh, little connection across yeah. the years. It's sort of like meaning, uh, meaning, I don't know whether coincidences are meaningful or not, but that's an interesting bunch of coincidences. <laughs> that's what I thought. And also for Enon Barnaton, who you're telling me specializes in Beethoven. It's one of the things he's known for. Well, and now that I've heard his Beethoven, I know why. <laughs> it, it's spectacular. Um, this one, well, I'm curious, how many of you have heard the second, Beethoven's second piano concerto? A fair number, okay, S but not everyone. I bet if I asked how many have heard the Emperor concerto. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, even yeah, more. Yeah, that's a very yeah. familiar one. The yeah. fourth and the fifth are probably played the most. The second was actually written first. I, you know, so it's maybe an, an anomaly of the publishing process that it ended up getting that number. Um, but yeah, it's his calling card to Vienna, sort of, hey, look me over, give me the eye, you know. So in a lot of ways, I mean, this is early Beethoven, and uh, many of you may be aware that Beethoven has three distinct style periods. He, the early Beethoven is very much in the classical style, like Mozart or Haydn. Middle Beethoven is really 
where we consider the Romantic style period to have begun. I mean, ba ba basically Beethoven ushered it in, and that's things like the fifth and sixth symphonies. We're doing the sixth pretty soon, by the way. Um, those are more, you know, it's more obviously romantic in terms of melodic, uh, the emphasis on melody, a uh, little bigger forces, although we're not to the ninth yet in this style period. And then there's late Beethoven. Now, it, in his time, even some of the middle works, but especially the late works, um, actually got reviews like, this was not music. People really weren't getting it yet. And tr to be you know, fair, some of the late Beethoven is still, it's so personal, it's so wildly creative, even within the constraints of the, the style he was writing in, that it can be very hard to understand. It takes a little exploration to really get it. So an interesting um, tidbit I picked up in rehearsal that I wouldn't have known otherwise is that um, the solos will be playing a cadenza Beethoven wrote late in his life. So at the end of the first movement, when the piano starts going crazy, I mean, it's, you know, the, those cadenzas are always full, they're show, show pieces. Um, if it sounds like a different composer, well, it is and it isn't. It's late Beethoven, set in this early Beethoven concerto. I just think it's really a cool juxtaposition to get to hear that. Oh, and I also want to draw your attention to what would have been the cadenza in terms of where it falls in the form, but it isn't exactly, because the orchestra keeps playing and the conductor keeps conducting. At the end of the second movement, somehow Enon Barnaton is getting the most amazing sound out of the piano. It is one of, it literally makes my jaw drop. You won't be able to tell, but <laughs> it does. It, he, he's making these simple, simple lines ring and it sounds like bells. And it's the most gorgeous sonority, and it's so transparent and simple there that you get to really lean in and hear this amazing sound. So uh, just look out for that. It's really special. Um, and you know, and actually, when I think about the third movement, something that connects in my mind to the Brahms symphony. So Brahms is well known for something we call metric displacement, which is where he makes the emphasis on a different beat, not the downbeat, not one, two, three, four, but one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And he does that hoping that you'll, uh, you, the listener, will think the downbeat is on four. And those things, someone asked on Saturday night if Brahms is very difficult. And I had to think for a minute because of course I know it all so well, it doesn't feel difficult to me. And then I realized, Oh yeah, those metric displacement moments, the first time you play that, you are so confused. It can be, and it's always, it's one of those things I would tell a student, you're supposed to confuse the audience, not you. You have to know what's happening. But it can be kind of um, tricky, and often conductors can be thrown, because they're, so much of what they're doing is showing where the emphasis is, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, it's in the wrong place. Um, so they can be, uh, that can be quite tricky. Now there's a little tiny, it's not the same thing, but in the third movement of the, the Beethoven, you know, the theme, it's a rondo, which means that this one theme comes back over and over again. Right, it's this theme, that, and notice where the beat is. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Well, toward the end, it comes back like that, just once. And actually, although I don't think it's marked in, it, in the score, certainly not in the parts, to be slower there, everyone does it just a little slower because you've got to go, wait, what? And it's a sort of a, a wink and, oh, it's just, um, just witty, right? But he's almost commenting on the way it's been by saying, this, that's the banal way to do it, right? Yetta, 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 da, 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 da. Now it sounds like a children's song. But if it's yepa, yepa, da, 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 it's just a different feeling entirely. So you get to hear it back to back. So I like that. It throws you off a little bit, and then at the end, you're off to the races. Off to the races. And, yeah. And Enon Barnaton, so much energy at the piano. Um, it's I, the, it's really amazing. It is so um, <laughs> entrancing, actually that he is making it sound so fresh and so new. I love hearing musicians who play a lot of new music play traditional pieces 
because at their best, they can bring that same fresh eye to it and feel so still within its very classy style that he's using in every way. Um, he's not coloring outside the lines or doing anything terribly outside the box. It just feels fresh and there's always a little bit of a sense of risk, even though it's not aggressive or, you know, but it always feels just like he's, you know, that sense of surprise is, is there, at which I'm sure fits the, right, think of your perception of Beethoven's persona. That just fits so well. And it, it brings it to life and makes it so um, energetic, even when it's peaceful. It's just very alive. It's not a museum piece at all. Yeah. Um, and also, I have to say, you know, I basically finished the concerto yesterday, and it was almost like smoke was going to come off the keyboard, but then played just a gorgeous encore, played Bach, and yeah. so much sensitivity. So an amazing player. Don't let him go yeah. after the... Yeah. Keep, Don't let yeah. him go. Just keep clapping until he get comes it, out. Get, get an encore, please. <laughs> yes. We want to hear because he did something different. Saturday insist. Night. Yeah. In yes. Yeah. <laughs> he did, yeah, he did some Beethoven Saturday <laughs> night. And that's the one. The one yesterday really brought is. I mean, he has just this ability to sing on the piano, and I, that one really brought that out. It was, it was great. <laughs> so then the Brahms. Um, I guess some changes from Mario, from the Maestro, oh, yes. through you guys. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the big one that stands out in my mind. So you know, in the third movement, there's that gorgeous theme. Da 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 di da dum da 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 di da dum. Right. We, this is one of the things. I mean, there are going to be people here tonight who came for that. Well, cellists know that so well. We know it backwards and forwards because it's on our auditions all the time. It's one of the what we call standard excerpts. Every single one of us has learned it to a fairly well. And we have our fingerings and our bowings now that, you know, already they have to do the bowings that I give them and I have to do the bowings that the concert master does. So, so, but still, we know it so well. And I guarantee you that every one of us, when we played it in auditions, did a lot of vibrato, right? So that's that. So you can see it when we're doing vibrato. And it's, it's in romantic repertoire, it's generally the default nowadays. Now, Maestro Venzago told us that that was not the way it was in those days. We know from later things where they started to say, well, here you might want to add some vibrato. And, you know, it, that it was an added thing. He says, it's not ketchup that you put on everything. <laughs> you, it's a, you know, so, <laughs> so we approached it without it being, um, he approaches it without it necessarily being an automatic thing that you're always going to have a rich vibrato. We're used to that here, right? I mean, any of you who've been coming for more than a few years have heard us play without vibrato quite a bit in the classical or Baroque repertoire. Um, doing it in a piece that's firmly in the Romantic style is unusual. Um, I was so proud of my section because we offered it, you know, we had already rehearsed the first two movements. We get to the third movement probably after the break, the coffee break. And we play it, we offer it, and then he says, lovely. Now, play it without vibrato. <laughs> and you could just hear the gulps. Everyone's going, what? <laughs> but like I said, I was so proud of my section because everyone just turned on a dime and we did it. And you don't just stop the vibrato, you change how you use the bow. You have to make all the shaping with the bow and you don't, you use a different sound. And of course, that's why the maestro wants it without vibrato. It creates a completely different sound. And um, then when at the very last time that melody comes with the violins and the cellos, we get full lush vibrato. Oh man, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> so it, I, I, I think that I, it's safe to say that no one in the orchestra would necessarily choose to do it this way. But in the context of this conductor's overarching vision of the piece, it's magic. And that is a real great example to me of you know, what a conductor can do. People say, well, what does the conductor do? I assure you, we can play these pieces without a conductor. In fact, we did quite a bit. He went out in the hall. He was new here, so he went out to listen 
and hear how the orchestra sounded and what the balance was like, because it's not the same when you're standing there than when you're there or there, right? So he went out and we just kept playing. We played like half a page at a time without a conductor. We can play without a conductor. But can you come up with the kind of intricate, deeply rooted, detailed artistic vision that you get from the conductor saying, let's do it this way? Of course, we could never do that. I mean, I guess Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, I guarantee you they rehearse more on a, than, than we do. You, it takes a lot more time if you're going to have a group arrive at that together. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because Orpheus doesn't, they don't have a conductor. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so that's, yeah. That, it, it's very rewarding to realize the vision when the vision is so um, special and effective and really gorgeous. He talked, he, one, of the, one of the clues about his vision that he talked about was that it's the difference between erotic and pornographic. <laughs> So, not that, that every moment is erotic in the music, but you get the, the gist. It's, it's a more, um, it's also a lot of it more inward. He wants it, uh, he also is going for something that's more fluid. So, so often you hear Brahms with this big, heavy Germanic, oh, it's like yeah. heavy Germanic, oh, rich and thick. And, and you know, schmaltz, not, yeah. and schmaltzy. I'm not gonna lie, we all love doing that. I'm not gonna lie. but. He said, let's do it more Viennese, because even though Brahms was German, he culturally and artistically was really Viennese. He, he worked in Vienna. He was associated with the Viennese musicians. It's, you know, it's Viennese. Now, I have to chuckle, because our current and previous music directors, both Viennese, Vien Viennese would have us do it in the more Germanic way. <laughs> but there you go. Um, it's, yeah, it's really lovely. Let me look at my notes and make sure I didn't forget any of the tidbits because he really did say some yeah. wonderful things. Oh, yeah, the second movement. Um, no, no, it's the third movement. Minuet in black. Yeah. So really that third movement is a combination slow movement and um, it's like the, it takes the role of the scherzo, actually because the second movement is an andante, I believe. I should know, yes. but yes, yeah. Yes, um, So he called it a minuet in black. And, and with that in mind, you can imagine that he is bringing out um, the dance character and the dance quality in the whole thing, but of course, especially the middle section, which is basically the trio. This, this movement definitely is a canvas for conductors because I remember, well, James de Priest doing this uh, symphony with him. And he would talk about creating a sound at the beginning of the third movement, again, talking to us cellos, that was like shoveling smoke. I love that metaphor, shoveling smoke. Honestly, yeah. I, I'm not gonna lie, I never quite figured out how to do it. <laughs> he, it he was a poet, a very accomplished poet. So he was, he, he, he was able to say things in a way that had a lot of uh, dimensionality and but I'll never forget that. It's such a cool image. Hmm. So yeah, that, there's a lot of possibilities in that. Yeah, and then, so after this mountain range of, uh, of a climb for the Brahms, there comes um, a little bonbon at the end. And you were saying the first, was it the first night that everybody thought, oh, we finished oh. the third. It kind of just feels like, oh man, we've well, it's quite I, a ride. To, I feel like I'm telling, like, or hanging out our dirty laundry, but, <laughs> but I figure, you know, you're here for some inside scoop, so I'll tell you this. We played the, the concert in Salem on Friday night, and a lot of us, including the maestro, forgot that we had the Hungarian dance to play. <laughs> <laughs> the symphony, it does end quietly, and that's one reason to have the Hungarian dance, so that we can, you know, end with a nice... Wee. But it, it was so exceptionally satisfying. I just, we all felt, I think we felt replete. It was, it didn't need any, we didn't feel the need to say anything else. No, that doesn't mean it's not a lot of fun to play the, the Hungarian dance. <laughs> it, it is, it's so fun to feel that, you know, we're, we, by virtue of playing together week after week after week, can turn on a dime and do what we call rubato. Um, rubato is the same root as rob, it's to steal. In music, we often, it's like you take time, take, right? 
Now, music, you give it back. You don't just take, you give it back. But those moments that all of a sudden, and da 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 ba 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 I mean, you know, it's not the same. I, I, none of them has been the same. There's those ends of phrases, and every single time we've played it now, they have never been exactly the same. Talk about fresh. Yeah. But we, we have a mind meld. We're t it's like telepathy. It's quite exhilarating. Yeah, it's fun to watch from, from the audience, I have to say. So I have time for maybe a couple of questions. I don't know if anybody has any questions for Nancy. Yeah. All right. Well, so I'll just tell you a little more about the whole the non vibrato thing and, and hope, oh, yeah, yeah. hope to direct your ears even further. Um, one of the, a couple things he said, and see, I, this, there's a reason I wrote this down. He really did say so many interesting things. Um, was that it also, it's like a horn and court style. So if you're familiar with, with that conductor, uh, you may hear some echoes of that approach. Um, I think also, um, Maestro Venzago is going for a real, um, like I said, it's very fluid, so that there's the ability to change the moods very quickly. And sometimes we will even change the tempo when it doesn't say in the music to change the tempo. And then you don't know whether or not it says in the music. Um, but you, you may notice an intensification of the character of the moment. I think if you go um, as far as you can in creating a musical, a, a character, right? And you, you've, you've um, controlled the sound. Like it's either, it's got a lot of vibrato, not a lot of vibrato, you change the balance, it's brass heavy or wind heavy or string heavy, you know, and you fix, you, you do all those things to create this uh, characteristics of this musical moment or this phrase. And you, you do articulation. We had a lot of specifics in the Beethoven and the Brahms from the maestro about where to be long and where to be short, because every note, there's multiple options, right? Even though it's written pretty clearly, there's still, is a quarter note, da, or da. I mean, that's, those, those are both quarter notes. So a lot of details like that. So it, once you've controlled all those things, you still don't quite have the character fully realized. Then you go to tempo. And you might need to go a little slower to allow it to breathe a little more. Or you might need to go a little, give it a little more energy so that it feels on the edge of your seat. So um, I hope you'll notice some of those moments too. There are definitely some deftly deployed tempo changes that heighten the character and the variety of uh, expressive characteristics that we're, we're deploying in the Brahms and the Beethoven and the Higdon, but yeah. it's in the familiar works that it's particularly um, noticeable, I think. Well, you're in for a great meal tonight. Um, yeah. With a Hungarian dance for dessert. With Hungarian dancing, yes. We won't forget, I promise. Right. <laughs> They'll remember now. Oh, we have a question? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, well, here, we, here, we have time for two. Yep. Yeah, so oh, like, I yeah, love what's this the question. character of... I love this question because like, the, the really quintessential example is that Philadelphia sound, that lush, rich string sound. And what is our string section known for? I think we're known for, for clarity, of articul you know, clarity and specificity of articulation, and, and the whole orchestra is known for a, a flexibility, for instance, to just immediately go, oh yes, we'll do that, that sounds cool, and really realizing it fully right away. Um, in a way, it sounds like the opposite of having, we don't have a sound, we have um, range, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. had one more question. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Right. Oh, so, um, <laughs> oh, uh, let's see, how quickly can I answer that question? Can you do that in a minute, Nancy? So, uh, <laughs> so my mom, took my sister and I to a Suzuki program at 